Welcome to the103advantage.com. Thank you for clicking on this industry webcast. We appreciate the time today and hope it will be time well spent. This website and its content is designed to show everyone that IBEW Local 103 and its partners in labor, the electrical contractors, are just that, partners. Today's program will help demonstrate that point. Over the next half hour or so, we'll talk about the labor management relationship, the new contract between IBEW Local 103 and the Boston chapter of NECA, the National Electrical Contractors Association, what's happening in new work and the market share battle, and whatever else seems to come up during this conversation. Joining me today, Mike Monahan, business manager of IBEW Local 103, and Glenn Kingsbury, the chapter manager of Boston NECA. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks, Thanks Dominic. You know, it's kind of strange, uh, you know, anyone that knows anything about the electrical construction industry to see labor and management sitting together under one roof with, you know, everything going okay. I mean, cooperation is, is part of your business. Do you agree with that, Mike? Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, the layperson's opinion of labor management, because they have, have different titles, yeah. is that we don't get along. Uh, and that may be the case for a good portion of organized labor. Uh, but sp specifically in, in the building trades, definitely Local 103 and NECA, uh, it is truly a partnership. We're in this together and we have a common goal, and that is to increase our market share and get the work. And uh, so we go at it differently than maybe other labor and management uh, arrangements in organized labor. Glenn, uh, you agree with those points or anything else you'd like to add uh, on the labor management uh, cooperation angle? No, Don, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, obviously, the key to our success, the key for any employer, every contractor, is to the workforce is the number one um, key to their success and having a good quality workforce, productive, trained, safe is the key to their success and that's where the relationship between the IBW and NECA is and our job, Mike's job and my job, is to make sure that we do the best to provide our contractors and our workers the tools they can do to be successful in the workplace. Now you mentioned it a little bit uh, in your answer and that, that is training. Um, you know, uh, I think the number is somewhere around $3 million uh, annually into your training fund, uh, your state-of-the-art facility just across the parking lot from the hall. Uh, maybe just go ahead and talk about just the dedication to training and how important that is in both uh, a labor management relationship because you guys jointly fund it and also how that makes sense uh, in the electrical industry, putting the best you know, labor force out on the job that you can. Well, I think certainly the IBW NECA joint apprenticeship training concept is one that works as a model. <clears throat> and uh, union and non-union, I think the non-union has looked at our model as well and, uh, and copied it a little bit. Other trades have looked at that model, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a great model. We fund it uh, jointly. We have about uh, just over a $3 million annual budget uh, which we fund, and uh, no grants, no government training, no public funding, <clears throat> and uh, we use that facility uh, to train the workforce of the future, and we can change on a dime. Uh, as we see different, um, different uh, industries change, whether it be the renewable world or product, uh, whether it be a fiber um, switch from a Cat5 to a fiber scenario, we can change, we, we, meet, we meet monthly and we talk curriculum, um, and we can change that quick uh, so we're ahead of the curve for the future in training and have the best trained both electrician and telecommunication technician. Glenn, uh, do the contractors play a role in, in that change in kind of talking about what the industry demands and what it needs in terms of being able to shift uh, curricula or anything uh, uh, along those lines to make sure that the best trained workers get out there? Absolutely. Our program is a, is a, it's called the Joint Apprenticeship and Training Committee and that's because it's, it's jointly uh, administered by both management and labor. Yeah. We've got committees, we've got subcommittees, we've got special committees that work on, you know, on special projects when we identify different market shares and we, we will bring in experts from both the contractors and from the workforce and help develop training programs to respond, as Mike said, as quickly as possible. When we identify a need, we move as quickly as possible to, to address that need to give both the contractor and the workers the skills they need to go out and capture the, you know, the, the emerging markets. Sure. Um, you know, the, the industry is constantly changing. Uh, what was hot today uh, may not be in a year and a half from now. And I think if you look historically at your facility, I mean, you talked about telecommunications back in the 80s. Uh, sure. Today it's 
electric vehicles. I mean, it just changes so fastly. So uh, the, the ability to adapt and grow and uh, on a moment's notice be able to get in there and make uh, you know, uh, changes to curricula is important. Do you agree, do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned telecommunications. I mean, Judge Green's decision on the deregulation of the utility, um, we virtually almost overnight had to uh, change our model. We were not in the data business uh, like the regulated phone companies were, so to speak. But with that decision, we had to write the curriculum. We had to get our apprenticeship program approved. I think, Len, we were the first uh, Certified training program yeah. in the country. Yep. First in the country, we had the first apprenticeship program uh, approved both by the state and the federal government. And that was done jointly. Uh, we put our heads together, we got uh, industry professionals, we wrote the curriculum, we had to get it approved. And we were up and running in a relatively short period of time. And uh, we benefited uh, greatly, both the uh, union and the contractors association, because of that relationship and being able to look forward. Uh, the electrical industry, a term that uh, people talk about, at least within the unionized sector, is you earn while you learn. Um, and I think uh, it's important for that because of on-the-job training and also the schooling uh, that you get in the classroom. But you guys recently made some changes to how you actually administer your training in terms of the hours that the students are actually in school. Uh, it used to be at night after the day was over. Uh, maybe just talk about the changes and I guess why that was needed. Well, we, we changed, um, like you mentioned, Dom, uh, uh, society changes. And the nighttime uh, learning is, uh, I don't think it's as productive as it, as it used to be. With the changes in the household and uh, the two, uh, two people working in the family, the other spouses going out the door literally as, as one is coming through the door. So the nighttime learning um, isn't uh, as productive as it once was. <clears throat> so we've looked at it jointly, and this is the first year we created a day school. So from here on out, uh, the first year apprentices this year, for 26 weeks, will go days. And uh, so it's daytime learning. Um, <clears throat> I think it's better learning. It's not after a long day of, uh, days of work, whether it's heat and cold and, um, and up early out to work. And so we, we think that this is the time <clears throat> to switch, and we did. And from here on forward, uh, next year, the first years, and so we'll be first and second, and, and so on and so forth. They will be going uh, days, and we think it's, it's better for today's environment. Uh, that buzzword I heard uh, Mike say a couple times in that answer, productivity, Glenn, I think from the contractor's point of view, that's very, very important. Um, to, to the effect that a, that, a, that a worker gets the job and is either uh, well-rested, ready to go. Uh, I mean, sometimes these jobs start very early in the morning, and that's not uncommon. Maybe just talk about that from the contractor's point of view, that productivity is really important to make sure that uh, the job gets done when it says it's, it's going to be done by. Well, absolutely. And I think that um, in, in the move to the day school, you know, just to elaborate a little bit on that, I mean, we have a terrific facility. And a lot of the, the move to the day school is to utilize that school to its maximum capability. Sure. And um, the, 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 the need for knowledge is constantly changing. And, and, in lifelong learning is a, is a concept people have heard of and it's something we really stress so it's not just at the apprenticeship program at the starting but journeyman training and update programs and so those guys they're pretty much working on the day so you know so that we're going to still utilize the facility for evening classes for that but the day school another thing too the a, a big aspect there is that training is so important that we feel we can get people trained quicker, faster, so they can be more productive faster. Uh, so much as the, the job site demands are such that it's not like the old days of the journeyman and the apprentice that could really spend the time teaching kids how to learn the trade. It's so fast paced today that you know we've got to move a lot more of that training into a classroom situation, stuff that was happening on the job. So that's another reason for why we're doing what we're doing. We hope that we're going to get a better product, better trained people, quicker trained, more productive on the job site, faster and better for the whole industry. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's that always that uh, question or the back and forth about who's more productive in terms of which labor force, uh, union or non-union. And you know, on this website, uh, there is a video which uh, uh, sort of recaps a study done <coughs> by independent project analysis where they looked at uh, hundreds of projects, uh, 
uh, apples to apples comparisons, really looking at the same job, union and non-union. And they did figure out, uh, speaking to your point, Glenn, that unions are 17% more productive and it's largely due to the training they receive. Uh, you want to expand on that at all, Mike, and kind of what that means in, in your world? Yeah, it's no surprise to me because we, of course, uh, we see it. Um, and uh, as you said, it's on this page. I think uh, it's safe to say it's to my left, the link to my left, the productivity <laughs> study that uh, Ed Morrow's <coughs> group did. It's important to point out that that was not, that truly was an independent study. That group that did that was, Kurt, was part of it. Um, and uh, they, are, they are not a anti-union, they're not a pro-union, and uh, so it truly is one of these independent studies. And we know uh, all independent studies are not really independent. Uh, but it, it showed that the productivity in the organized sector uh, was 17% more. And he also goes a step further on, uh, uh, on wages mm -hmm. and benefits and why, uh, why the unionized sector uh, can uh, get paid more and get better benefits is because of that productivity. So uh, it's not all the hourly rate. Uh, someone can make half the wage, half the benefit, uh, but if the competition is twice as productive, then it's, uh, it's really, it's equal. Well, and you get uh, into the whole aspect of how it's built. And, you know, uh, better training, better skills, better safety, uh, that also uh, comes into the equation. You're going to have a, a better product at the end. Uh, with that uh, yeah. in mind there. Yeah. Um, well, the safety is a big piece of that. And Glenn and I, uh, and we work hard at it with, uh, in the training facility with, with training. And uh, Glenn had some great stats, Glenn. Uh, you want to share those on the workman's comp um, changes, what they are today uh, versus not so long ago. It was yeah, when we, was, we were talking earlier about training, um, one of the things that we've really focused on training in the last 20 years or so is safety training. Mm -hmm. We train. Um, Every one of our people has through, been through OSHA 10. We teach them OSHA 30. Mm -hmm. We've got, uh, we've just put the entire uh, workforce through 70E, which is the NFPA standard on dealing with live circuits. So we've really focused on training very significantly. We've got, um, uh, you know, confined space training, yeah. so on and so forth. And it has paid off. That really has paid off. The construction industry, the electrical industry in particular, is a much safer industry. Not saying that it's, you know, it's still construction, right. it's still, you know, it's still, you know, one of the more risky businesses to be in. As they say, we're not building gingerbread houses out there, but still, it's much safer than it was 20, 30 years ago. I was just looking at workers' comp rates, and workers' comp rates today for electricians are about a third of what they were back in the early 1980s. And that's a testament to, you know, how much safer, and it's not, you know, and it's, it's the, you know, focus on, you know, safety with the contractors. They've all got safety officers now. They really focus on it, and that's a part of, you know, one of the things that we should be proud of as an industry, that we have made our industry a lot safer um, because, as we say, you know, the goal is that everyone goes home to their family at the end of the day. And there's a hidden cost that the most people don't see, that the employer has to carry for comp. So when you're a, th you know, when you lower your, your comp by a third, there's a, there's a real economic uh, value there that uh, return back to the employer and the customer uh, as well. Um, this summer, uh, as we turn into fall, uh, this summer you, uh, uh, Boston NECA and IBW Local 3, your, your contract was up um, and uh, you successfully renewed it. Um, let's go ahead and talk about that a little bit, uh, the process, and now that it's, uh, that it's over with, what the new contract entails. Well, I'll start off. I mean, negotiations and collective bargaining, really, I mean, it's what we do. Mm -hmm. I mean, for 100, over 100 years, the IBW has represented electrical workers. And for over 100 years, NECA has represented electrical contractors that employ IBW electricians. So that collective bargaining process is what brings us together. And it's really the focus of what we've done. But over the last hundred years, we've grown so much from that point. The JTC in exam is a prime example of how much we've grown from that. So now, negotiations, you know, they're, they're always hard work. There's nothing easy about it. There's no shortcuts. But we're really happy. We signed a five-year agreement, which was, um, you know, very unique in the industry. 
uh, with this uncertain economic climate. Uh, you see most of the agreements in the collective bargaining coming at one or two year agreements at the most. We bucked the trend, five year trend, five year agreement, which I think speaks volumes to our relationship in Boston, the commitment both from the union and from the contractors, a commitment to the future to say, okay, let's get this behind us and focus on the future. That, you know, that, that the business development, that working on you know, training our people, you know, transitioning to day school, uh, bringing in these new concepts to you know, help contractors get work and employ more people, that's really what we're all about. Well, it's t it sounds like teamwork is a, is a good uh, descriptor word that uh, you guys would like to use for that. Yeah, partnership, teamwork, um, it, negotiations. I mean, certainly it's, uh, it's not something that's pleasurable to spend your whole summer uh, in negotiations and try and iron out a contract. But this is the second consecutive five-year contract that, um, that we've been able to uh, ratify by both, by both parties. And uh, it, it certainly, I think, speaks to the trust and the relationship. <clears throat> I think why some employer associations are demanding the one and two year. Um, I don't think anybody sees the construction industry rebounding that quick. Right. So um, I think from the employer's point of view, you know, across this country, they feel more comfortable with a one or two year contract. Um, but you know, I'm uh, I'm ecstatic with the contract and how it worked out, and glad that we can put that aside for the next five years. Mm -hmm. Why we're able to negotiate decent contracts, I think, is um, uh, I think it's safe to say the employers look at the union as a as a stable um, leader uh, in the in the industry. Um, just to regress a little bit on the training, uh, we we uh, purchased a new building right behind the training center, so that's going to be a virtual construction site where we can do more hands-on. And with that purchase, uh, the employers saw the commitment uh, to training. And <clears throat> where Glenn was, what Glenn was speaking to, if you can make a second-year apprentice, um, tomorrow's second-year apprentice, where yesterday's third-year apprentice was, then there's value there. And it's not all in the hourly rate, as, as uh, Ed Morrow's study says. And <clears throat> as we raise the bar in the apprenticeship, we expect more. Training is better, um, and, and that's, there's value there, and that's why I think, uh, you know, why we're able to negotiate uh, decent contracts in Boston. Um, your commitment, uh, the team's commitment, uh, your partnership uh, to the industry over the last 10 or 11 years in terms of market share has really blossomed, um, and it's, I don't think it's any accident. You guys are very uh, in tune with that and aggressive on that front. Uh, that, you know, during the negotiations, I don't think it's anything uh, uh, unfair to say that there was uncertainty there, and mm -hmm. it showed in the numbers. But then once the five-year contract was ratified again, those numbers were even better than they were prior. I mean, that relationship and that people need to know what's going on and have a certain amount of certainty that it's going to be okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> you, you brought up that point, and uh, as Glenn represents the employers, and on, uh, on my end, uh, representing the membership, we were certainly distracted during the summer and uh, why I'm glad it's five years. So um, Glenn was focused in other areas, I was focused in other areas, we weren't um, discussing as much as we do targeting certain jobs and how we're going to win them and um, we had the worst numbers <clears throat> this summer during negotiations uh, than we've had I think in five years and I don't think it was by accident. The employers uh, not knowing what was going to be negotiated, what was going to be ratified, they were a little reserved. On the union end, we were distracted and not chasing the work like we normally do. I mean, we really um, focus in, we identify our targets, our jobs, and what do we have to do to win them. And we jointly um, team up and go at this really jointly and how we're going to win the job. So we were distracted, and I think the numbers speak to um, how, how those distractions can really affect your market share. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that problem for another five years. Um, and I'm glad we don't have them on a daily basis where the labor and management are not on the same page. So uh, agreement got ratified uh, the last day in August and uh, September's numbers, uh, the market share in September <clears throat> was in the 90 percentile. Mm -hmm. When we could put the contract behind us, 
focus in on what we normally do, and we went from the worst to the best month in a matter of two, two months. So, so it's, uh, it seems like that the contract or the, the certainty, the renewed partnership, it's, uh, I mean, it's a tool for market share, if nothing else. Uh, you agree with well, that? Well, yeah, risk is, risk is the most difficult thing for a contractor to deal with. Yeah. And, and, uh, and labor being the most important part of what, uh, the biggest part of their, their bid, their prices, that's the, the thing that they've got to worry about the most. Mm -hmm. So the contract provides a lot of stability there. And I think you're, Mike was right that, I mean, you know, particularly in that July, August range, you know, they didn't know it was going to happen on September 1st. So now that they've got, you know, five-year commitment there, they know from that perspective. But in addition, I mean, some of the other significant things that we did on in the settlement was we, we focused a, a tremendous amount on the apprenticeship. We made a lot of changes there, a lot more focus on, we talked about the day school, we're increasing dramatically the amount of training we're giving on our tele data branch. Uh, we're moving to a five-year program in telecommunications. Um, so there's a lot of focus on the training. We're going to commit a lot more money to it. We're going to, you know, we, we talked about the $3 million. We're going to increase that by about 50% over yeah. the next couple of years. So. It shows a commitment from the union and the contractors to that, that focus. And we added, you know, some flexibility on the, um, on the workforce yeah. lo lo uh, area as well. This is another key thing for employers. So we made some adjustments in the way the union runs the referral hall. So it adds some more um, flexibility there and, and, and provides some certainty there. So employers can, here again, eliminate some risk and hopefully you know, focus on gaining market share, business development, going after new markets. Anything to add, Mike? Yeah, no, just uh, really, uh, Glenn said it all. I mean, uh, it's, um, it's a win-win. Glad it's behind us. Now we can focus in on, on increasing our market share, which we've continued to do um, for the last, I think, 12 years. We've continued year after year. We've increased our market share, which is not the case in many industries, especially in construction, especially in the organized sector <clears throat> of the uh, construction industry, uh, we have uh, year after year increased our market share, both in the public and private. And once again, it, it's not by accident. And we've done that at a time where, where we've increased uh, our pay and increased our benefits. And how we do that is by working together, increasing productivity, marketing, um, and a true uh, Local 103 NECA uh, partnership. Being that uh, it kind of sounds like there's a new day, you know, in the construction industry, the electrical construction industry in Boston, um, and hopefully uh, the economy will uh, rebound uh, and will follow suit. I mean, you guys seem like you're you're very primed to go after that. Uh, on the jobs front, any good news uh, coming out of Boston uh, to get some of the members back to work and contractors? Uh, uh, back uh, bidding jobs? Well, we're, we're fortunate, um, <clears throat> it depends what economy you're in, but we're fortunate in Boston to have a couple of economic engines, three or four economic engines. Um, <clears throat> the, of course, the higher education engine is great. Um, came to a screech and halt uh, in uh, 08 mm -hmm. with the meltdown of the financial industries and their endowments taking a hit, like everybody did. So construction more or less came to a halt in the higher ed. <clears throat> The biopharmaceutical uh, industry, we're lucky to have it. Um, it's, been, it's been slow, in, uh, but starting to grow again, so we're fortunate there. The transit um, area, uh, the infrastructure in our subway system and our transit system um, <clears throat> with budget cuts has been neglected, but out of necessity now, um, we are starting to see some more work there. In tourism, uh, residential, uh, those are also engines that we have, not in the single family home um, uh, market, uh, that still has its issues nationwide, uh, but in the high rise rental apartment, which was a switch from the condos, is, uh, is really taking off. So um, the, the, you know, the universities, uh, Harvard University just announced uh, last week that they are now going to move forward with their billion dollar life science <clears throat> facility that was more or less capped off in 08 um, and uh, other universities from Boston College, Boston University, ha MIT, Harvard, Wentworth, Northeastern, Emerson, um, Suffolk, uh, you know we're fortunate to have all those engines. They all have aggressive uh, building plans now that uh, 
they've recovered from 08 and uh, looking forward to that work, of course. And UMass Boston being one of them. UMass Boston, uh, great PLA there, uh, close to a billion dollars worth of work uh, at UMass Boston, and that has broken ground. And um, the, uh, the uh, Kennedy uh, Center next door for Ted Kennedy, uh, that is moving forward, both under a project labor agreement and both have broken ground. Uh, in PLA news or union construction news, uh, casinos, uh, where do they stand? Well, last week, uh, the Senate, uh, 24 to 14, affirmative vote 4. So House and Senate both voted in favor. Uh, then now it will get uh, reconciled in uh, conference committee and they will put together a final bill for the governor to sign, which <clears throat> we have every reason to believe he's going to sign. He's indicated he's in favor of it. And once uh, his signature is there, um, uh, the next portion of that will come. The committee be developed on the selection of the applications for a casino. That's three casinos in the state uh, defined by regions in one slot <clears throat> facility, just slots. Tons of job creation there, Glenn. Uh, would you agree with that? Absolutely. We're looking forward to it. Okay. 8,000 jobs uh, at peak construction. I mean, that's an estimate, yeah. um, but that's uh, certainly a good sign. Yeah, with all three casinos, uh, full-fledged casinos, in the slots, they're estimating about 2,000, uh, I mean 8,000 construction jobs, two per facility. <clears throat> and we're biased, of course. We, we've been promoting Suffolk Downs, which is uh, in the city of Boston, and uh, we feel that uh, they certainly have a better than 50% chance of um, getting one of those applications, <clears throat> and, um, and they're going to be ready to go. Uh, another piece to that is we actually um, through the relationship uh, that we have with the ownership, Local 103, uh, through a merger of Local 123, uh, another IBW local, uh, we will be representing a large portion of the full-time workforce there. Uh, those are the, uh, the in-house slot, um, slot people and mutual clerks and waiters and waitresses and so on and so forth, as well as uh, the area trades uh, maintenance crew, we will have a uh, full-time workforce in there as well, <clears throat> maintaining the whole facility. And that's all been agreed to, and um, it's just a matter of building it and uh, moving forward with it. And moving, uh, moving on uh, you know, from that uh, to uh, more of the public image standpoint, uh, more of the advertising standpoint, uh, the television radio uh, campaigns that uh, your team, IBW NECA team, is currently involved in, um, all of that is, is uh, absolutely necessary in your point of view. But maybe just talk about uh, everything that people don't see in terms of business development work, uh, uh, you know, setting meetings and developing relationships with developers. I mean, how, how contractors and also IBEW folks, you know, expand their own businesses <coughs> by being a part of your organization. Yeah. We, you know, we've uh, jointly identified um, that we can no longer react and wait for the phone to ring. <clears throat> so we, we identify projects early on. We get involved in the permitting process. Uh, I mean, there's two Walmarts that we will be uh, building because we got in early enough and uh, partnered with them as well and said, listen, we can help you through the permitting process for that. We've got an agreement to do those two Walmarts and, and a Lowe's uh, as part of that. But we get, we get in early. And, uh, and team with the developer and show that we're not, um, we're not the bad guy. Yeah. We're the good guy. We're going to help you uh, through this process and our members that live in these cities and towns can support uh, smart growth and development. And, uh, and it's been a good thing on changing our image with them, not once they get their permits, then we, uh, we're knocking on the door. We get in early and show them that we can, we can work together on this. Uh, anything to add, Glenn? Yeah, and from the contractor's perspective, I mean, much more of the industry is moving to a design-build type of a model these days. So our contractors have that capability to help those developers to help divine, uh, design, uh, to, to kind of formalize uh, what their project should be, kind of help build with budgets and so on and so forth. So our contractors are very much involved with that and, and helping move that process along from the very earliest part of the project. Uh, from the building trades point of view, being IBW one of the building trades and National Electrical Contractors Association being their contractors, uh, there's a new saying that they're 
uh, pushing from coast to coast, and that's value on display every day. It seems like everything that we talked about here uh, over the last uh, 15, 20, 25 minutes really speaks to that point. Uh, and it seems to me just with the last you know, couple minutes about business development and the other avenues, uh, m you know, setting meetings, getting involved with the uh, bidding process and the permitting process, that it seems like it's easy to do business with IBEW Local 103 and, and Boston Eco. Would you agree with that? That's always been, I think, the case, uh, Don, but it was, never, it was a story that was never told. Mm -hmm. So um, certainly jointly, we've tried to rebrand ourselves. <clears throat> Not that a lot has changed, we just needed to tell our story. So uh, we jointly do radio, we jointly do TV, um, we do, uh, you know, print, not as much print as we used to do, but uh, we are constantly now telling our story. We can, it's not the public's job to learn about us. It's, it's our job to tell them about us. So we, we jointly uh, uh, rebranded ourselves and we get developers and users, um, once the project's done, we ask them if they'd be willing to uh, just talk a little bit about the job and the quality and the craftsmanship. And uh, it's nice when a project is done. It's not a quid quo pro. Mm -hmm. uh, when it's done, you get uh, developers who are willingly uh, interested to tell the story. So uh, we do that a lot. Easy to do business with Boston Nika? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We're open for business. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you for your time today. We certainly do appreciate it. Uh, uh, good uh, back and forth discussion and obviously cooperation and teamwork is, is definitely evident. So thank you for your time. Terrific. Okay. okay and thank you to you out there. Tell a friend or 20 about this program. There's always something new on the 103advantage.com. In fact, this site is going to be redesigned to meet the market and always stay ahead of the curve. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Until next time, I'm Dominic Geritano.